you have a calling on your life. And your calling is to bless people. To bless people. To bless people who who curse you. To bless people who are mean to you. To bless people who stonewall you. To bless people who don't like you. To bless people who ignore you. To bless people who love you. To bless the near ones and the far ones, the easy ones and the hard ones. There's a calling on your life that is wonderful. How can you make your life a blessing to others? In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper looks to 1 Peter 3, 8 to 12 to explore our extraordinary calling to be the kind of people who do not return evil for evil. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on September 11th, 1994. Of all the hundreds of things that Peter could have said about believers in describing the kind of people we are or that we're supposed to be, what did he say? In verse 8 in particular here, notice that he says not first a list of things to do, but five kinds of person to be. That's not as obvious in some of the versions as it is in others, but Let's just walk through these five traits of personhood that should mark all believers. Number one, all of you be harmonious. That means literally have a common mindset, which probably doesn't mean have all the same tastes and all the same habits and all the same minor priorities. There's a lot of diversity in the body of Christ. I think what it means is that we should think and assess the essentials of life the same. God, salvation, virtue. He wants the body of Christ to have a common mind as it confronts the world. Have a harmonious, common mindset. Number two. Be sympathetic, all of you. Sympathetic. Feeling what another feels. So that when it's time for action, after you become that kind of person, you can act in a way that's sensitive. You know, most people who have this quality about them do not say, I know how you feel. Because knowing how you feel, they know it doesn't help to hear somebody say, I know how you feel. And therefore, they don't say that. It's a very time-intensive, presence-intensive trait here. doesn't talk much. Sympathy doesn't talk much. It is there much. You feel it when it's there. Third, be, all of you, brotherly, which I take to mean... When you think about the relationships to somebody in your small group or somebody that you know at Bethlehem, your thought is not that they are a distant person, an unrelated person, nor even a distant relative, say an aunt or a cousin or a grandfather. They are in the inner circle, like a brother is in the inner circle. And we all know who have grown up in families or live today in families that families can have real, real tensions. There can be tremendously harsh words exchanged between a husband and a wife or brother and a sister or a parent and a child. And very, very rarely do those harsh words result in the destruction. It's amazing how resilient the family structure is when you go back and play all the tapes of the last 20 years. If you accumulated all the mean words and all the harsh and sensitive things that a husband said to a wife or a parent to a child in a moment of weakness, wow, what an awful tape that would make. And we're together still. That's what he calls us to. Number four, kind-heartedness. Now, this is a beautiful, strange word in Greek. It does not have to do with your conduct first. It has to do with your belly 
first. Your insides, literally your bowels, your splunkna, you splunknoi. It's a great word. It means good boweled, good bellied. It means having a generous, deep innards. In other words, it's exactly the opposite of hypocrisy or being tender on the outside and malicious or hard on the inside. It says, it says if you're going to be tender, be deeply tender. Let it go down into your bowels. And the fifth one is be humble in spirit, not just outwardly servant like, but authentically lowly. I think that's begotten of recognizing that we are absolutely, utterly dependent on God for our breath and our life and our strength and our spirituality and our emotional well-being and all the things we have. We feel fragile and we feel vulnerable if we recognize how utterly dependent we are. And when you feel fragile and vulnerable and utterly dependent on the free, sovereign grace of another, you cannot be arrogant. It's a blindness to God and our dependence upon him if arrogance begins to get the upper hand in our lives. And you add on top of that dependence, there's this awareness that I am vile. I'm a sinner apart from God's redeeming grace. If he were to depart from me and take away his sanctifying influences, I would just be a crisp cinder ready for hell. You add those two things together and you have the makings of lowliness of spirit before you have any kind of action at all. So those five things are what Peter chooses to mention here. A common mindset, sympathetic heart, family, love, kindly disposed out of the depths and a humble spirit. Now, that's rare. That's a hard way to be. You might say, as I find myself saying, Peter, you asked me to be what I am not. You asked me to become what in myself I have no resources to become. I can't make myself like this. And uh, I think Peter's response to that comment would be, remember chapter 1, verse 3, that by the great mercies of God we have been born anew to a living hope. Nobody can be this way on his or her own, but only by the mercy of God begetting us anew. I think he would say, if you're born again, if the spirit of God really dwells in you, if you're the children of God by adoption, if Christ is now your treasure and God is your hope, the seeds, the seeds at least of all of these traits are in you. And if you put your trust in the living God, that will become the avenue by which the Holy Spirit makes these seeds grow into all the fruit that he means to bear in your life. This week, I'm reading through Isaiah like many of you are, and I came to Isaiah 26, and these verses ministered to me this week more than any other verses have, where it says, Thou dost keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. And then the next one is a command. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. In other words, don't think of trust mainly as a backward glance. Think of trust mainly as you got a rock. And the rock is everlasting and therefore trust in the Lord forever. Trust now. Trust five minutes from now. Trust when you walk out of this service. Trust this afternoon. Trust tonight. Trust tomorrow morning. When that happens, when we learn to live this way, and I am just learning to live this way, it feels like after 42 years as a Christian. When we learn to live by faith in this future dependable rock. You get up in the morning and you trust him for the day and you go to work and you trust him for this crisis and you call the hard call and you trust him for this conversation and you give that gift and you trust him to meet the needs and you live by faith in the future grace of the next five minutes or the next 5,000 years. When you learn to live that way, the Holy Spirit, as it says in Galatians 3, 5, comes on the path of that faith and takes these seeds and makes them grow into 
common mindset and tenderness of heart and sympathy and brotherliness and humility. You can't do it on your own, but you can do it by faith in the one who loved you and gave himself for you. So even though the goal in this text is a kind of personhood that you can't perform, there are things in small groups that can be done to help each other become this kind of person. And I want us to go to verse 9, spend the rest of our few minutes on verse 9, and see, if we can, a dynamic here of how you become this kind of person and how can help each other become this kind of people. Okay? Now, verse 8 has described for us the inner change that's called for. Oneness of mind, sympathy, brotherliness, kindheartedness, lowliness. Verse 9 moves beyond this inner change to behavior. Not returning evil for evil. There's the negative. Or insult for insult. Now, here's the positive. But rather... When evil comes or insult comes, giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. There's an ambiguity in this verse. That has to be clarified before we can apply it to ourselves and the habits of small groups. So I'm going to I'm going to test your your thinking caps now. So put them on for the next five minutes as I confront you with a problem. Sorry if you don't like to see problems to me. Most of the riches of scriptures open up when I see problems and spend the hours it takes to ponder them in relation to other scriptures. So if your mind doesn't work that way, then uh, mercy, mercy on the next five minutes. Here's here's the crucial question. This word calling, you were called in verse nine. Does it refer to our act of blessing those who insult us? To this you were called, this act of blessing so that you might inherit a blessing, or, second possibility, is the calling, the calling to inherit a blessing? Now, let me paraphrase those two so you can get them clearer as alternatives in your mind. Here's paraphrase number one. Does the verse mean, bless those who insult you because you were called to do this? Fulfill this calling so that, secondly now, this is not the calling, this is the effect or the result of the calling, so that you might inherit a blessing. That's alternative interpretation number one. Here's the second possibility. Does the verse mean, bless those who insult you, comma, because you were called to inherit a blessing? And the calling is not your action of blessing others. The calling is your inheritance. Now, maybe you say, wow, what difference does it make? Because in both cases, you're supposed to bless. And in both cases, you're supposed to get a blessing in the future. Well, that's true. The difference is huge, however, because the difference lies in the relationship between my blessing, those who insult me, And my receiving the inheritance of a blessing. How do those relate to each other? That's what's at stake in these two alternative interpretations. And the answer to that question is tremendously significant. If our calling is to bless others who insult us or treat us in any way that would tend to make us angry, if our calling is to bless them. Then verse nine teaches that that is a condition that we meet in order to inherit the promise. You see that? Bless those who insult you so that in order that you might inherit a blessing and your blessing is contingent in some way upon your 
blessing others. Now, that is the interpretation I think is true. I'll tell you in advance before I give you the reason. The other interpretation would simply leave that question open and would say, you are to bless others who insult you. And the ground of it is because you've been called to inherit a blessing. I think that's true. I just don't think that's what this verse is saying. Now, let me try to give you a reason for why I think interpretation number one is right and why it makes a tremendous difference to observe it. Look back to chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, and you will see the parallel that convinces me that our calling is to return good for evil. Verse 20, you remember when we were dealing with servants, says, God finds it beautiful and it is a favor with him when we suffer for doing right and endure it patiently. You see that in verse 20? It's, it's good in God's sight when, when we are mistreated and we endure it patiently. That's the same as not returning evil for evil in verse 9. Now, why is that good and why are we supposed to do that? Now, verse 21 gives the answer. For you have been called. There's the key word. There's the key parallel that convinces me that verse 9 means that our calling is to return good when we are insulted. You have been called for this purpose since Christ suffered for you. So to me, this is an unmistakable parallel that clues us in that Peter wants us to hear verse 9 saying this. Return insult with blessing. Return evil with good. Why, Peter? Because you're called to this. It's your vocation. So that you might inherit a blessing, which comes in some way as a consequence of this fulfilled calling. Okay? That's where I stand on the interpretation of the verse, which opens now a mega question for us that has to be answered to understand both how to understand our own walk and how to help people in our small group. But before I I raise the mega question, if anybody this week woke up in the morning saying, why, why, why am I here? Why do I go to work? Why do I go to school? What's the point? I just, life is just, it just seems like a circle. It just seems like it's going nowhere. What's the point? One answer is real clear in verse 21 of chapter 2 and verse 9 of chapter 3. You have a calling on your life. And your calling is to bless people. To bless people. To bless people who who curse you. To bless people who are mean to you. To bless people who stonewall you. To bless people who don't like you. To bless people who ignore you. To bless people who love you. To bless the near ones and the far ones, the easy ones and the hard ones. There's a calling on your life that is wonderful. That you can devote yourself to from morning to night if you just go through the day asking, how can I make my life a blessing to this person and that person and that person and that person? How can I just bless? That's a great way to live. Try it. Try it. But now the dynamics of being that, helping each other be that, we have to ask this tough question. If, as I have now concluded... My blessing you is a condition of my receiving or inheriting a blessing. Then are we into legalism? This text is not teaching that the future blessing of our inheritance is earned by works. Our blessing others is not a work that is meritorious 
that God writes in a book, in a ledger, which he then must pay us back for at the last day so that we don't inherit a blessing, but we earn a blessing. That is not what's being said here. Chapter one, verse 13 says that at the appearing of the Lord Jesus, we are awaiting grace. What he brings when he brings our inheritance is all grace. He does not bring payment for our lives. If he did, we'd all go to hell. There's only one payment. The wages of sin is death. And we sin every day. Secondly, in chapter one, verse five, he says we are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Not through works for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. But don't equate works with doing things. Works are meritorious efforts to get God's favor for people who are desperately unable to trust in the cross. Third, the word inherit rules it out. We're going to inherit a blessing as children of a father who has a great inheritance to give. We're not going to earn blessing from an employer who has a big bankroll to pay. However, and this however is what is so broadly, especially at the intellectual level today, misunderstood. Take heed now. The blessing that we receive will be graciously received. We will inherit it only if we're born again. Only if we are born again. And the evidence of being born again, according to chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, is that we are born into a lively hope in God. The evidences of your being alive, that is, born spiritually and not dead spiritually, is do you have a living hope in God? And the evidence of having a living hope or faith in God is that you embrace him as your treasure, you hope in him, and you are satisfied with him And the evidence of being enamored by God, of cherishing God, of hoping in God, of trusting in God, of embracing God as your treasure, is that your life becomes a foretaste of your cherished future. That's what verse 9 is about. Your life becomes a foretaste for others... Of your cherished future. So ask yourself this now. See if this doesn't help. What future are you now cherishing? Money? Sex? Family? Health? Your life will quickly become a foretaste for others of those priorities in your life. They'll see it. They'll taste it. But if your future that you cherish is grace coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ... And that is your treasure, and that is your hope, and that is your faith, and that is your vision and what you hold on to and embrace. You cannot return evil for evil. Your life becomes a foretaste of your cherished future. You know why you can't return evil for evil if that's where your heart is? Because the cherished grace that's coming is that he's not going to return evil for evil to you. And if your whole soul is gripping and loving and embracing that hope that he will not return to me evil for my evil, that he will bless me even though I have insulted him with so much of my misbehavior, then we cannot turn around and have a lifestyle of returning evil for evil. Or insulting for insulting. And therefore, the point of saying that it's a condition for that is simply this. You must be born again. If you are born of God, you love God. If you are born of God, there is a lively hope in God. If you are born of God, God is your treasure. 
And if God is your treasure, your life echoes your cherished future. And therefore, it's a condition, not in the sense of earning anything, but in the sense of bearing witness that you've fallen in love and live out of that confidence. When you gather together in a small group, the main purpose is, will you help each other become this kind of person? That is, will you direct each other's hearts away from false treasures and deceptive fulfillments and point each other to Jesus so that week after week you fall in love all over again with him? This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 10-part series, Living Out Our Faith, with a sermon titled, Sanctify Christ as Lord. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.